so uh, we installed uh, at T-Rex uh, a few months ago. Um, and uh, I gather between then and now, I've missed your summer. Uh, but anyway, I will tell you a little bit about PCH and what we're doing at T-Rex and uh, why you might want to peer with <coughs> So um, just a sort of history of the organization. We started in 93, 94 when there was essentially only one exchange point out there uh, in Washington, D.C. Everybody had to ship their traffic to Washington, D.C. and back again from wherever they were, and that was expensive, and it seemed kind of unfair. And then you think about it a little bit, and you realize it's not unfair. It's just that you haven't done the work that they had done to build an exchange, so we went and built built five exchange points up and down the west coast of the U.S., and then uh, people started asking us to help them build exchange points in other places, so we did, so then we formed a nonprofit, and the industry has been kind of funding us to take on infrastructural challenges of various sorts ever since. Um, so uh, we started doing TLD name service in 97, providing uh, DNS service for country code top level domains first, and then uh, more generally for um, uh, some IDN TLDs now, uh, for um, you know some of the GTLDs, so forth. Um, we started uh, deploying AnyCast root name servers in 2000, uh, and have worked with I think seven of the root name server operators so far to, to do that. Um, we started providing service over IPv6 in 2001 and got to sort of complete dual stack in 2009. Um, we started doing infrastructure security stuff in 2002 with INOC DBA uh, hotline phone system that uh, probably quite a few people in this room are on. Um, and uh, our most recent major initiative is DNSSEC signing. We're uh, holding the um, zone signing and key signing keys for 43 uh, zones at this point. Um, uh, I think Argentina is the largest one, uh, but like Greenland. <laughs> and, uh, we, have, we sign greenland.mil.gl. Uh, uh, I've always kind of wondered what was in mil.gl, but you know. Um, uh, so what we do now, um, four major areas, uh, support for internet exchange points, um, which uh, takes the form of some training, some sort of advice and help and coordination, some equipment, um, uh, some lobbying and, and helping them with dealing with governments. Um, DNS support. Uh, so more than a third of the top level domains out there on our infrastructure now um, we're currently doing deployment for two root server operators that will probably be up to three shortly um, we uh, run uh, we're the secretariat for NFDBA but we're also a participant in NSPSEC so we do a lot of security coordination uh, people find themselves under a DDoS attack or something like that, and uh, they don't know what to do about it, and we wind up stepping in and talking through the process of uh, characterizing the attack and getting that attack signature out to other ISPs who can then block um, the attack traffic from the source, uh, and then sort of coordinating with law enforcement on the, the findings about the attack. Um, policy and regulatory, we do a lot of work with governments and have for 15 years now explaining why voice over IP should not be a crime, uh, why the internet should not be used as a way of moving intergovernmental subsidies between countries, you know, various kinds of idiocy that has to be shot down. Um, spending a lot of time right now preparing for the wicket, which is this big meeting in Dubai at the end of this year in which um, the ITU will try to convince governments to give it control over the internet and internet protocols, um, but you know that's that's not a new fight. I mean, we switch switch microphones. Okay. Is this one already on? Yeah, it's 
so. Uh, it's not a new fight either. Uh, I was in Uganda two years ago explaining why uh, the ITU should not take over control of the BGP protocol from the IETF uh, in order to fix its deficiencies with doing wiretap because the ITU had discovered that BGP did not include wiretap provisions. Um, <laughs> so there, there's a lot of idiocy like that that has to be addressed uh, and that consumes a fair bit of our time. Um, so sort of where we're where we're moving right now. Um, right now we're sort of in the beginning phases of rolling out an upgrade. It used to be our large sites. We used um, Cisco 7301 routers and our small sites used 2811 routers. So these um, can move about three gigabits of traffic total and these uh, about 200 megabits or sorry, 100 megabits through. Um, we're switching to ASR 9000s and ASR 900s. ASR 9000s, doing some 9001s, some 9006s. So those are uh, 40 gig installs, and the ASR 901s uh, have 12 1 gig line rate ports. Uh, so we'll probably be upgrading our install here to an ASR 901 um, you know, sometime in the next few months. Um, we're doing more dedicated diagnostic hardware. Oh, well, and so this is. Um, this is across 85 locations all over the world. So we've uh, we've done so far 10 of, we've swapped out 10 of the 7301 sites for ASR 9006s. Um, and we haven't yet finished lab work on the ASR 901s. So uh, we'll start upgrading the small sites shortly. Um, we're doing more diagnostic hardware in new installs. So we've got a dedicated box that is just analyzing NetFlow and PCAP, um, mostly so that we have a better sense of what's going on during attacks and so that we can collect better statistics and sort of metadata about the traffic and the attacks against us. Um, we're doing some additional DNS set sites. So our first two were Singapore and Zurich. So those were the places where we have the vaults that contain the keys and do the signing. Uh, we're adding Additional ones in San Jose, uh, California, and Montevideo, Uruguay. And with those four, we're going to call the, the system done. Uh, we've got a bunch of work that we've done on INOP PBA uh, to add crypto and uh, authentication features and stuff, and it hasn't really gotten rolled out. So we're um, trying to sort of get that out into the wild so it can get used. Um, and also a bunch of conference bridging stuff. Uh, we did have, well, touching on the next point, more open source tools and libraries. Uh, we did, however, release um, a uh, iChat voice to SIP gateway open source so that uh, you can use iChat voice on a Macintosh to talk to any generic SIP backend. And that was so that people, we, we did it so that people could use INOP DBA without having to have a special client if they were on a Macintosh, since we found that somewhere upwards of 90% of our users were uh, running Mac OS. Um, uh, we've also got a fairly large open source project that we've been working on for a while that's getting closer to becoming real. Uh, that is kind of a one button installer for the package of software that exchange point operators need to run the server at an exchange point, because exchange point operators are typically a router guy, right? Uh, or a switch guy, not somebody who wants to do a lot of sysadmin on you know, Apache and you know, MySQL and so on and so forth to have, say, the in adder DNS for the exchange point subnet work and the mailing list for the members of the exchange point work. And have the graphing for the traffic on the exchange point work. All these things, right now there are 350 exchange points out there. Say 100 of those don't have that, and the other 250 each had to do it themselves individually and have done so with varying degrees of success. So um, that's not a huge base of users for an open source project, but it's important enough that it seems like something we should support. 
Uh, and we're sort of getting to the point where we have fully staffed offices kind of around the various time zones so that we can, you know, deal with things. Uh, it used to be that we only had fully staffed offices in California and in Nepal. And so now we've got uh, guys in the Caribbean, uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, Argentina, and uh, Trinidad, which gives us a little bit more around the clock coverage. Um, this is a wide angle photo through the window of the door of the Zurich DNSSEC signing facility. Um, so this is 20 meters underneath a bank in downtown Zurich in a nuclear bomb shelter. And uh, you can see the video cameras here. So it's got uh, live streaming. Yeah, you can go right now if you want, uh, pch.net slash dnssec slash zrh, the airport code for Zurich. Um, so uh, this, it, it's going to be really boring. It will show you the, the views from those three cameras of exactly that with presumably nobody wandering around in there. Although on the views from these two cameras, you can see uh, Swiss government officials peering through the little window that this camera or this picture was taken through on um, tours periodically. Um, you can tell it's really secure because these lights are lit up green. If they were lit up red, it would mean it was not secure because the doors on the skiff there were not uh, locked. Inside, so we're 20 meters underground in a bomb shelter. Uh, then there's this vault, which is a hardened room. Inside the vault, there's a skiff, which stands for Secure Compartmentalized Information Facility, which is basically a safe. Inside the safe is another safe, which is called IPS, an Information Protection System, I think. Stupid acronyms. <laughs> but basically, it's a safe that you can run a server inside, so a safe with integrated air conditioning that doesn't pass gas between the inside and the outside, uh, and has a fiber pass through. Inside that, there's an HSM, a hardware signing module. Inside that, there is the TPM that actually holds the keys. So it's five layers of physical security, each one more hardened than the last. Um, so this, this system, together with the one in Singapore, constitutes one of two FIPS 140-2 Level 4 certified DNSSEC signing systems. The other one, aside from this one, is the one that signs the route. So this one is one that ICANN asked us to build in order to provide high security signing for countries so that CCTLDs could do DNSSEC at a level of security that would make their military and banks and so forth happy and that would be at at least the same level of security as the route itself. So we're basically doing everything that they're doing for the route. We're trying to sort of improve best practices a little bit, and we're not doing it entirely in the US. So the US government told ICANN that they had to sign the route entirely in the United States. We thought that other countries might find it more useful if it did not happen all inside the United States, and in fact happened in four different neutral countries and if we compared the result of every signature from all four locations in real time before publishing the data and through an error if they did not all agree. So if somebody compromised this location, they would also have to compromise the other locations in exactly the same way at exactly the same time in order to actually publish any false data. So that's the, the DNSSEC stuff that we've been working on recently. Uh, one other thing, everything you see there, the entire package, server inside, all that, 65 watts of power. Because the lighting is all LEDs, almost no power to make that go. So how much of that is lighting? Is uh, most of it lighting? It's actually about half and half. The, the hardware signing module inside, the HSM, um, is very low power because the more power that an electronic device uses, the more it throws off in signal off of the traces on the board. And that can be read, uh, uh, read by a tuned antenna next to the device, right? So, um, so the physical security keeps you from getting very close. 
And then there's this box, which is steel and grounded, and seals up all the way around. And then there's another steel grounded box inside that. And then there's the HSM inside that. And so the idea is that the power is so low that even if you broke through this layer that you can see here and the next layer, you still wouldn't be able to put an antenna next to the HSM and read electronic signals crossing traces on the board. So very low power all over. Um, on the other hand, not so low power is that's what our our server installs look like at the large sites now, the SR9006. Um, those four 10 gig interfaces are the 40 gigs facing the um, uh, facing the world. Um, and then we have a 40 gig trunk up to, actually, let's see. It looks like that only has 20 gigs of the trunk lit up at the time this picture was taken. But the idea is we've got 40 gigs out to the world. This is uh, Frankfurt, so um, 10, I don't remember where it's all going, but um, uh, 10 gigs onto the Frankfurt Exchange, 10 gigs to level three transit, 10 gigs to NTT transit, 10 gigs to something else. Uh, so 40 gigs up to switch, and then there's a stack of servers up here uh, that's um, uh, one gig, or actually four gigs to each of the servers going up there, 10 servers. And then there's this box, which has a 20, a 20 gig trunk to it uh, for doing the PCAPs and <coughs> and all that. Um, we're trying to get it very uniform so that everything is sort of 40 gigs towards the world, 40 gigs from the router to the switch, 40 gigs from the switch to the PCAP box, and 40 gigs from the switch to the servers. Um, so we'd be honored if you guys would peer with us if you're not already. Um, We've got two ASs. AS42 uh, is a Cisco box carrying the production DNS traffic. If you peer with that, you get to um, four instances each of two root servers, uh, eRoot and LRoot, that we installed here a few months ago. Actually, uh, uh, I've only seen one route from those two instances, so I think it's still in the Oh, okay. Sorry, I will. <coughs> I will but it, but, it, but, it, but all this, all this will be coming. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, if if we haven't finished the turn up somehow, we will right. make sure that gets done. Uh, and then AS thirty eight fifty six is a Quagga instance running on one of our servers, and we use that uh, for the research traffic um, uh, routes that you advertise to us on thirty eight fifty six. We will archive away in an archive that researchers use to sort of see how the internet grows over time. We've been doing that since, I don't know, 96 or 97. Um, you can see a list of our other peering locations, a bunch of nearby <coughs> ones, about 85 locations, 2,500 peers right now, uh, 18,000 peering sessions to those 2,500 peers in different locations. So we're happy to peer with you in as many locations as you feel like peering. And, oh, uh, also, we're hiring programmers. If anybody knows folks who can code and are looking for work, please get in touch with me. Um, mostly sort of writing analytical code that produces displays of analyses of all the data that comes out of our research network, um, but then also a bunch of sort of crypto and security stuff for the uh, INOP DBA um, communications. Um, and the, the operator community is always sort of asking us for different kinds of analytical tools. So we don't really know what they're going to ask for tomorrow. Um, it's kind of fun work. Uh, but it's always easier for us to find router people than programmer people. If, if, you, uh, yeah. if you hire someone, do they have to move to California? Uh, no, but they can. We have a very good record of getting people green cards. Uh, we're at, as a research nonprofit in the U.S., we get a special exemption that allows us to um, get H-1B visas immediately any time of year without going through any of the quotas. And uh, we can apply directly for green cards without 
going through each one of these first if we want to. Uh, but we also have people working for us all over the world, so um, we don't really care where people are if it's where they want. So please, if you have friends who are programmers, tell them to send me their resume. Uh, yeah, question. Regarding the VNSX search, um, can you have a server in there and just connect to the IP or what it means? So the, there is a server inside the <coughs> IPS next to the HSM. The server has two Ethernet interfaces on it. One goes to the IPS, sorry, sorry. One goes to the HSM and the communications, that's just a back-to-back -back cable. So the communications between those are direct and there's nothing else that um, is on that network. The other interface on that server talks out to over an IPsec tunnel to our other boxes. Um, so we get a unsigned zone file from someone over a protected, from say a CCTLD administrator over, uh, we try to do it over a protected link of some sort, but uh, it's also got a, um, sorry, there's a shared secret DNS, it's a, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm too jet lagged. Um, so anyway, a, so there, there's, at, at, a, at a very minimum, there's a shared secret mm -hmm. on the zone transfer of the unsigned zone from them to us. Uh, then we push it into that server. Mm -hmm. That server hands it to the HSM. The HSM does the signing operation, hands it back to the server. We take it from that server, the other servers, we compare the results. If the results are the same, we push it into our Anycast distribution mechanism. Send off, I believe. Okay. And I mean, there's a firewall between mm -hmm. that server and uh, the general purpose internet, of mm -hmm. course, as well as the top. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, it's nothing is ever perfect, right? The specification calls for a whole lot of hardware security, and it doesn't really say anything mm -hmm. about network security. So, we're just kind of making that up as we go, and we're trying to do a reasonable job. And uh, if you have suggestions, we appreciate hearing the suggestions from you rather than having you demonstrate them first. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Um, do you have backups of the keys uh, Yes, so um, the HSM, each of those HSMs is part of a family that uses very strong I think it's 8,000 bit, I'm not sure, um, shared secret between the members of that family. Um, so there are seven people who hold shares of the keys necessary to activate the HSMs. Uh, five of the seven people have to be there present with their tokens in order to activate any of the features that allow you to clone a new box into that family of HSMs. In order to use an HSM to generate a new key signing key, sorry, a new zone signing key from a key signing key, we only need three of the seven people. So we periodically, about four times a year now, have a key ceremony where three of those seven people come together and you know use their smart cards and so forth and make more zone signing keys. Those zone signing keys are encrypted with the shared secret, and they get pushed out to all the HSMs. Um, so yeah, every HSM in the family has the full current set of zone signing keys, and then we've got uh, three that have both the key signing keys and the zone signing keys in them, and those are stored offline. Those never get connected to the internet. So no key signing key is ever held in anything that ever touches a network. Any other questions? If there are any other questions, please talk Later. to him yes, uh, afterwards. Because it's no longer a lightning talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. 
Well, uh, yeah.